Arts Alive, sponsored by the Arts Alliance of Yamhill County. Jesse Anderson Studio sits among giant oaks just off Highway 18 in Sheridan. I have done artwork my entire life. I can't remember a time whenever I didn't have a pencil in my hand, even as a little kid, you know. And when I finally got up to, I think I was age 11, my folks scrounged enough money together to buy me a little set of oil paints with those little tiny tubes, oh, you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a guy there in town who was teaching some classes, kind of like Shemekina puts oh, on yeah. the classes. And so I took my first class in and I was just, uh, I was into it full bore <laughs> after that. And I never had any classes at all except through school. Mm -hmm. And I had a art teacher in high school who really took me under her wing, kind of. And uh, she really pushed me a lot to keep painting and keep doing artwork. And, and I really wanted to be a commercial artist. That was the whole thing I wanted to do. It really turned out full circle with her because years later, uh, I stayed in contact with her a lot. And when I went over, I had an art show over there and she came to my art show and stayed there for three days while I was doing the show. Wow. And when it was all over, she asked me if it was possible for her to hire me to tutor her, to teach her. Oh, so that she was your teacher and then she beat you because it, it really was a, oh, yeah. you know, it's good for your ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I've always pushed to make every painting mm -hmm. better than the last one, yeah. always, always. Yeah. I, I love to paint. Yeah. I, I don't paint for the dollar. I mean, if they sell, great. But I love to paint. You and know. you paint mostly life, life, wildlife? I paint a lot of wildlife because I've worked a lot with wildlife sanctuaries and I've had hands-on with all these animals. So, I mean, I've hugged a 2,500 pound rhino around the neck. I've had mountain lion laying on my lap. I've had cheetahs walking between my legs. I mean, I've had orangutans, you know, where I played with them and chimps. And, and I love the animals. I, I just am a real strong animal advocate. So to me, it's a joy when I paint them. When I painted the Wild, the, uh, wild West over here, um, it was more for the studio to get into a gallery. I enjoyed painting them, but not as much as I do the wildlife. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is I, I'm a real avid fisherman and to paint water scenes just makes my heart sing, you know. Yeah. I put water in most of my paintings, I have to admit that. Um, I just love the looks of water. To me it just is so soothing, it feels good and and it makes me feel good. And that's that there's a lot of it sure, right there. Sure. sure. And and we have behind us, we have these wonderful seascapes. Yeah, these paintings here, most of them were done um, from shots that I took over around Cape Kiwanda. Mm -hmm. And of course, water, you can't photograph water and paint just like you do. It just puts you in the mood to do it. And that's what I, a lot of my photographs are. Uh, they just put you in the mood and then you take it from that and you run with it and do whatever you're going to do. But you have to study your water out and know your water. There's no way you can run with it. I mean, a lot of people, so they say, I want you to teach me just how to paint that, paint that right there. I say, well, you know, you could copy this little note for note, but until you understand what the water is doing, you'll never paint water. You know, you have to understand where the reflections and where clear water, where you can see through it and what makes it look like there's a depth in the middle. And, and uh, you, you, you've got to get patterns like the foam patterns on this, for instance, they make the whole artwork. Um, that's the contrast that you have to have in between the two. So there's a whole lot of things involved in that. I, I taught seascape painting alone uh, for almost seven years. And it got to the point where I was making so many seascape painters that you couldn't give a seascape away because there were so many of them around. So I kind of laid off the, of the seascape painting. I worked with inmates for over 30 years. And I started off in Vacaville Prison, which was a real heavy-duty prison. Um, if you can imagine, the, uh, the uh, class that I had had murdered 38 people. I mean, that's, that's how heavy-duty it was. And my son was just a little tiny guy, and he actually learned to walk between these guys' fingers. You know, they, you can say what you want. Um, I've always been a firm believer that Every artist is about that far from the edge anyway, because we live fuller, I think. Uh, we take more chances, we do all those kind of things. And in the prison, there's just a whole lot of those guys that went over that little edge. And there's actually people outside that I trust less than the ones that I worked with in there. 
<laughs> but uh, at one time I got a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, and there was only five people in the United States that got that. So I felt pretty fortunate yeah. about that. Um, and we met down in Vacaville. And uh, we went to Folsom and we went to different places, you know. And a funny story about that. We were going through in this group that I was with. They were scared to death because they were in a prison with all these inmates. Oh my God, they were scared to death. And they were walking about this far apart. And I was the last person in a row. And as we walked through there, I was looking off to the side in the art room and there was a guy there sitting with his head like this. And I said, I just stopped and they just kept on walking. And I said, are you having problems? And he says, I can't figure out how to paint this right here. And I said, would you like me to show you? He said, would I? And he jumped up and I sat down. So I started painting. And then I had another guy here and another one here and another one there and another one there. Until I had a whole group around me. I couldn't even see around. And so I finished and I said, do you understand? Absolutely, he says. So he takes his painting, another guy throws his painting on there. He says, I'm having problems with this. So I sit and showed him. I said, you understand? Yeah. Here comes another painting. Here comes another painting. It was 45 minutes. Wow. And the group had gone on and they didn't know I was gone. Ah. And this guard came running back, scared to death that something had happened to me. And here I was painting for all these guys. <laughs> it was pretty funny. He just stood and shook his head and he says, come with me. <laughs> But I never in my life, in all the years that I was in prison, and I taught here in Sheridan, the federal prison, mm -hmm. quite a bit too, and uh, I never had one second that I ever felt like mm -hmm. I was in trouble. Yeah. Not one second. I always felt that if there had been the biggest rumble in the world, there, I would have had a circle around me. It was so much that when my daughter drowned over in Devil's Lake, uh, it was the most tragic thing in the whole world. And out of Vacaville Prison alone, I had 40 homemade sympathy cards because oh, they couldn't buy them. Yeah. They made them and sent them to me from inside the oh, prison. sweet. That's just sweet. So that's pretty, yeah, cool. that pretty cool. And of all the years I taught that, I've never seen one of my guys ever go back in after they got out. Oh. And most all of them have contacted me after they got out. I still help them. I know three of them are showing in galleries. Two of them are just top, top uh, tattoo artists now. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of it. So. I'm very, I'm very proud of that oh, yeah. work. And it actually, of all the teaching I did, that was my best time. And I felt so good about it. I was a mentor to all those guys. So, yeah, it was kind of... Jesse had wonderful stories about his paintings. When I was first working with the inmates, you have to understand that inmates are a completely different class of people. And you don't get respect, you earn respect. Yeah. And so we had our set of rules and I laid it down to them and I became so tight with all those guys. And they like to paint things that are a little tougher. So I painted this painting in front of all of them so they could see just how to do hair techniques. And of course, this guy has got that bad look. Yeah, yeah. And I think before, whenever I had him in there uh, with the federal prison, you're only allowed to move like once an hour inside the prison. And you've got 15 minutes to move from this building to that building and the doors lock again. And if you get caught outside and you're not inside during that time, you go to the hole. So everybody in the prison wanted to see this painting. And there's 1,500 of them out there. So I had to leave the painting there for about 10 days so that everybody coming through could get a vision of this. And I think this was tattooed on the backs of about 20 people before I got out of that prison. <laughs> now, for the longest time, I painted many, many, many of this kind of painting where they had real clear water, you can see to the bottom, you can see all the stuff in real. I love painting this kind of stuff. And I work my own techniques out and all of it. I'm completely self-taught when it comes to the fine arts. Um, my teaching in the art school was for commercial art, pen and ink and that kind of stuff, doing ads and yellow pages and whatever, you know. Um, but this kind of stuff here, I love to paint this. Um, but this is a funny story about this particular painting. It was hanging in the gallery and a guy came in and he looked at it and he says, this is not realistic enough for me. And I said, really? What would you do to make it more realistic? He said, if this was real, you could see beer cans and pop cans and all kinds of stuff down at the bottom under the water. <laughs> and I said, never going to be in my painting now. Okay, this painting here is one that's kind of got a little special meaning to me. It, I've met so many of the wild animals and this guy was in a mall in, in Tacoma and he was in there for almost 35 years. 
and he had never seen another ape in all that time. And the kids would go through their ears behind glass. They would throw stuff at him. And when I met him, he had the saddest eyes I'd ever met in my life. So when I painted him, I painted him with the tears. And I titled this painting 35 to Life. And, you know, I thought it's almost like solitary confinement for him. <laughs> and so the first prints that I made were pretty large prints. And the first one to sell sold to Judge Tishner right here in McMinnville. And he put it in Judge's Chambers. Now, 35 to Life, Judge's Chambers, I think those kind of go together okay. pretty well. And he said, you know, it, every time that he would go to sentence a person to like prison and stuff, he looked at that painting and he realized what he was going to do to another person. And it actually, he thought it made him a better judge. I think he's an awesome judge anyway, but... You know, it made him a better judge. So that was kind of interesting. About uh, two years after I painted this, um, he was rescued from that. And he has now, he's got two wives. And uh, I had a group of seniors in here. And I heard one of them, I told him that story. There was an old guy in the back. I heard him under his breath. He says, boy, he knows what real troubles are now. And my whole goal when I went out there was I wanted one of those rhinos to eat a apple out of my hand. And... There was having another little gal with me, and she had the camera was filming the whole thing, and and I kept getting this one rhino to come in there real close, come in close, and his brother who was with him, it was jealous, and he would charge me, and it was six times I was running around around a tree, twenty five hundred pound Volkswagen with a horn on the front of it, you know, chasing me, and she was taking pictures of it, and the last time he came in, she was about five feet from me, reaching out to get that apple. And the other one charged in, and then the two of them just turned around and walked away. I came home within an hour and started doing this drawing. I spent a lot of hours painting that, but I, I sold an awful lot of prints of this yeah. too. And I've offered it to the Rhino Society or in Africa to, yeah. uh, if they want to use prints of it, they're more than welcome to use prints in their advertising. Any one of the sanctuaries that I paint the animals out of, I always offer prints to them, always, always. Uh, the, uh, Center for Great Apes down in Florida. I, I furnished prints for them a lot of times. Shirts with my artwork on the shirts, you know, those kind of things. Okay. That's good. Uh, there's a wildcat sanctuary. I've always furnished stuff for them. There's uh, just a lot of I enjoy, but it also gives me backdoor passes see, for all those places. So I get to <laughs> be with the animals. And, and I mean, I've, I've held red pandas in my arms. I've had all these animals that I just dearly love. Yeah. Uh, that's the best part of all of this part. You know. This painting, um, it came about a, a, a thing I saw on TV where they did a documentary about this particular ape and his family, a group. There was 125 of these little baby chimps who were about this big that were captured out of the wild and they were sold to a pharmaceutical company. And they were kept in cages that were five foot by five foot by seven foot. For 35 years, he'd been inside of that. Inside of a building, They'd never seen the sun, they'd never seen anything. They had a tire hanging in them that he slept in the tire. And the people that worked there were told, if you even give them a name, you're fired. You're not to do anything nice to them, you're to have no connection to them at all. They're strictly here to be used. And Tommy was cut open like 360 times after being given every kind of drug you can imagine. They would, they would sedate him down and pack his eyes and nose full of women's makeup to test for allergic reactions. They, they did all kinds of just horrible things to him. And at age 35, there was only 15 of them still alive. Now these guys lived to be 65 years old. So you can imagine that 35 is not halfway through their life. It's almost like a 35 year old person. And uh, they gave them all the AIDS. And then they did the test on them with the AIDS. And uh, as soon as they were done, they were gonna put them all down. And this lady up in, in uh, Montreal, she sued them, and she took the 15 away from them. And her sanctuary has 30 foot tall trees in it. Mm -hmm. It has a stream running through it with grass. And I mean, everything you can imagine. And when she turned them loose in there, she said they spent 48 hours out there, wouldn't eat, wouldn't do nothing. Just feeling the grass and feeling the trees and looking at the sky. They had not seen it yeah. since they were this tall. And uh, this guy here, he hated everybody because he'd been hurt all of his life. And he would run at the wire and he would try to tear it down and anybody got close. Well, they're eight times stronger than a human. 
Tommy could hang by a bar and lift a thousand pounds off the ground. That'd give you an idea how strong he is. So he could do some real serious damage to you. And there was a fellow who went to work there and was an ex-dairy guy that every day he would sit next to the fence and he would talk to Tommy through the fence. And he would slip a piece of his sandwich through or his donut or whatever. And Tommy just and him made a bond like this. And one day he wanted to go inside. And they told him, you can't do that because he's a wild animal. Well, he did it anyway. And he sat down on a chair and waited for Tommy to come to him. Tommy came in and saw him turned around and sat on his lap and he was beating on Tommy's chest like this here and he was laughing like a little kid. So they started teaching him how to paint and Tommy loved to paint and uh, he would ask for it and so they would take in an easel and they would take his temper paints and he would stand back and he would paint and he would stand back and look at it and he would paint and don't you dare touch that thing when he's done with it but when he's done he'd tell you get it a whole new one. And they would sell his paintings for like three, four hundred dollars. His paintings were like this. I mean, there was nothing fancy about them. Yeah. But uh, that helped sponsor the place right there. And you can tell by his eyes and so on that he had a lot of wear and tear on him. But this is one of this is one of my favorite paintings that I've done. This is this was totally something different for me. I was in a gallery in Santa Fe, and it was a very high-end gallery, and I mean, there was so many expensive pieces in there, and I wanted to be in that gallery in the worst way. So I sat down with the owner, and I had my iPad with him, and I showed him all my artwork, and he said, man, I really like your work, but he says, I can't sell nothing but cowboys and Indians. So he says, can you paint cowboys and Indians? And I said, I can paint anything. So he said, why don't you do me up a series of paintings of cowboys and Indians, and let's see what we can do. And uh, I told him, I says, I'm in the middle of remodeling my house right now, and I would be dead if I left that, because my wife knows where the gun collection is, and I would be dead, but give me a little time, and I'll, I'll do it for you. He said, no problem at all. So it was about a year and a half later, and I had found a model, this guy here lives in, in New Mexico, and he modeled for me for a lot of those, and, and uh, the Indians, they're kind of pretty much made up. I, they're not a real character, but as close as I could get. And I painted all these and I called down and he told me, I'm the new owner. I bought the gallery from this other guy. And I went, oh no. So I said, well, I told him the arrangement that we had made. He said, I'm always into new artists. So fire him down to me on the email. So I, I shot all these here and uh, there was a couple others that are sold now too. And uh, he looked at them all and within an hour, he emailed me back and he rejected every painting. And I said, why? I thought they were pretty well done. He said, I like broad strokes and bright colors and thick paint. And it just shows you the difference in galleries, yeah. you know, gallery owners. He liked the really, really impressionistic stuff. He would paint with a palette knife. He'd rather have a palette knife. He said, this stuff here is too realistic for me. He says, that you're not an artist, you're an illustrator. And that kind of popped my bubble for a little bit, to be real truthful. <laughs> I'd worked a lot of hours. If you look at some of these up close, you can see that there's a lot of detail in all of them. So, um, But I'm proud of them. And so I have sold prints off of them. I, that's okay. I'll, I like people that like my artwork. Yeah, right. I don't want to put it in some place where they don't like it anyway. So I need to find another gallery. I, yeah. I, maybe I'll get something a little closer in Santa Fe, maybe Arizona or someplace up there. But in the meantime, I spent a lot of hours, but I enjoyed painting them because they were something different for a change. Jesse has an amazing number of artistic projects. There's a country and western star, his name was Tommy Overstreet, who uh, recorded for 50 years, 60 years, something like that. He had like seven number one hits, he had lots of recordings. And he was my best friend for lots and lots of years. And uh, he and his friend who wrote songs together had written a book. And the book was called The Graham Cracker Kid. So you can kind of see, there's what the book looks like. Um, and he had me illustrate the whole thing for him. And we illustrated in pieces and so on. So it was also made into a, video that was put on the internet and when the books came out we did a bunch of book signings and so on and people who bought them from us they also got 
a disc with Tommy reading the story in the book. And the disc is worth the whole price of the book. And Tommy, unfortunately, I lost him here a couple years ago. But in the meantime, that kind of gave me a big boost. And Jimmy Rogers got a hold of me, who's been a good friend, that did Honeycomb and oh, Kiss is Sweeter Than Wine and all those. And he wrote a book and he wanted me to look at doing some of his. And, and I've got the whole book here and I've been kind of doing some sketches and stuff off of it. So that may come about, we'll see. But in the meantime, I wrote two books for my two grandchildren. And so I've got about five more illustrations and I'll have both books done. But these are some of the illustrations out of the book that you can kind of see. And these are my babies, you know. And the whole story will be, you know, like she's wanting to know how to cook. And so she's teach big sister teaching little sister how to cook. So these, all these things like this, they were, they're in my house. This is what they grew up with. Um, I bought them magnifying glasses. And they would always go out and gather up bugs and stuff and look at them. So I had to yep. put that into my book. <clears throat> Here's where she's teaching her little sister how to ride the horse. So we wanted to get some things. I want all these are things that are actual things in their life. Uh, this is in my right here on my patio. She's teaching how to ride a bike. Um, here's big sister teaching little sister how to play on the swing. You know, so there's just all this yeah, kind of yeah. stuff is uh, I, I really put my whole heart into them. My whole goal was I wanted to do something here that that uh, here's another. Yeah. Uh, I want them to be able to go to school read the book to their class yeah. and let the class see that it's them in the book. Yeah, yeah. I just think that would be just the That's coolest really thing for them. Um, so like I say, I've just got a few more to go and, and then all these will be done. So that would be kind of fun to see that happen. What a wonderful thing for a child too. Just wonderful. Yeah, stuff. I've had yeah. these kids painting and uh, doing artwork since they could hold a pencil. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> this is a picture that I did of her painting when she was only four. You know, and so the little one was being taught yeah. uh, from the older one too. So it's, it's kind of fun to it see it pass along. Yeah. Whenever they get here, they have to be in my studio. They have to have their own easel. They have to have their own palette knife for mixing the paints. And they want to know everything there is to know about it. And so yeah, yeah. to me, that thrills me to have yeah. that pass on. Yeah, you know? yeah. Let's go and they're that. not that old. Uh, the ones turned eight this this next month, and the other one just turned five. Yeah, so. so. Perfect. But if they start there, no telling where they could go with it. That makes it that makes it even Definitely. more special. That's the part about you have to paint a lot, and the more you paint, the better you get, the more you understand what you're painting. And that's really important. I've said that I all my students that like in the prisons and so on, I would have them work for six months with nothing but pencil, no painting whatsoever. Because if you don't have good drafting skills and good drawing skills, uh, to do this kind of work is impossible. And all it does is give you a good hand-eye coordination. And so whenever you're finally painting, you get a drawing down. The rest of it is so easy, you're just doing more drawing, but you're using a brush instead. And uh, I'm a real strong advocate of that. Drawing is the basis. The Harvest Tour, uh, I was on it years ago, and for some reason I got off because we had places that we were going to be during the time, and it just seemed like every year it worked out exactly the same time that we were going to be somewhere else. Last year we were in India. I mean, it just always was something. Uh, but when I had people through here, we would have minimum of 400 people coming through the two weekends. And uh, so many of the sales that I made were prints of all this stuff. You know, people just love to take these prints and go do their own thing with them, which is great. Um, and I enjoy having people come out anyway. And um, there's a lot of people who have come back later and brought friends or relatives or whatever they call me up ahead of time. And hey, you bet, no problem. Just give me a holler, make sure I'm home. You can come in my studio anytime. It's always got an open door here. We hope you enjoyed Arts Alive. Sponsored by the Arts Alliance of Yamhill County. Produced by Merrill Lake Studios. Thanks for watching.